and we can Great. start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all again for getting to see me a second time this week. Uh, you can blame Jim for that one. He he was the person who allowed me to have two talks. So if you have any complaints about that, go and direct them to him. Uh, so tonight I'll be talking about my life amongst the authentications and my year with Cunny DM. For those who weren't here on Tuesday or who are watching the recording, my name is William Brown. I'm a senior software engineer as part of SUSE Labs. And you know, at this event, the reason it is so dark behind me is that it is 9 p.m. at night here compared to the middle of the day or morning for the most of the other people here from Europe and US. Uh, and that's because I'm in Brisbane, Australia. So the best way to get in contact with me if you have any questions is via email as I'm often not online. So wbrown at suza.de is the best way to get in contact. And um, you know, as mentioned, uh, my day job is working on 389 directory server, which is an LDAP server. And that's used uh, by SUSE and SLEE, which is you know, replacing the open LDAP infrastructure that existed previously. And I'm also the creator of the Cunny DM project, which is what we'll be talking about tonight. But speaking about LDAP, let's talk about what the current state of open source identity management looks like. Um, I really, you know, am very passionate about identity management and authentication and security. Uh, and I've used all of these projects at some point within my home network or have, you know, in some way uh, contributed into, in, into them. Um, but realistically, these are the kind of four major projects that you're going to see on a network today. Now, there are others. But when you go into a business or you know that kind of network, you're probably going to see one of these four as a centralized authentication or identity management service. Now, the two at the top, OpenLDAP and 389 Directory Server, are probably the major LDAP server implementations. OpenLDAP uh, uh, is you know backed by the Simus Corporation and was previously shipped in a number of distributions, but that's slowly being phased out. Uh, and 389 Directory Server, which is you know, supported by SUSE via my own work and, and the um, employment of me, uh, is also used as well by Red Hat and is sold by Red Hat as their Red Hat Directory Server product. Now, the two LDAP servers, these are really uh, building block products. So they are, you know, they're like you get a box of Lego bricks and you've got to put it together yourself. So they can be a bit uh, hard to use sometimes, and certainly there's work going on to improve that in 389, but you know, they are just an LDAP server. The two across the bottom, FreeIPA and Samba, are the other two kind of major identity services you'd probably see. So Samba 4 is a Active Directory compatible domain controller. Now, Active Directory being the Microsoft Active Directory uh, system. And Active Directory is itself a opinionated combination of LDAP, Kerberos, and a number of other components that provides a complete identity management solution. So rather than being like a box of parts you've got to put together, you can install something like SAM before AD, and you have a network capable identity management system. FreeIPA is the open source domain controller equivalent. Uh, and that is based on 389 Directory Server as its LDAP server and MIT Kerberos for its Kerberos uh, single sign-on use and a number of other parts to give a web UI and some other bits. But generally, FreeIPA is aiming to become a domain controller in the same way that MSAD or Samba 4 is. And that means that they're a little bit more opinionated. But realistically, what you can see from all of this is that they're all heavily underpinned by those kind of technologies like LDAP and Kerberos. And unfortunately, today, there's a number of limitations with these, especially around things like multi-factor authentication. And generally, that as libraries and protocols, they aren't receiving as much development and attention as other areas. When we contrast this to what is happening in uh, proprietary systems, we see things like Azure Active Directory or Okta or Auth0. And they're moving to a very web-first, uh, web single sign-on, uh, hardware cryptographic auth via things like WebAuthn, and a very different uh, direction, which is really shedding a lot of the legacy that has previously existed and opening a lot of interesting integration options. 
Whereas most of the projects that we're seeing here, like OpenLDAP, they're very focused on being a database and high performance. 389 is very held uh, back a little bit by FreeRPA's requirements. FreeRPA is investing a lot of resources to improve their Active Directory global catalog implementation to improve their trusts. And Samba 4 will always be playing catch up against MS Active Directory, which is you know, not related to Azure AD. So in all of this, given my interest in authentication and IDM, I really wanted to kind of break out of this and do something new. And that's why I created the CunEDM project. So I introduced it last year at SUSE Labs, and some of you may have seen that talk. And, and I discussed much more there about the reasoning behind that. Um, I really want it to be kind of you know, in the middle of these two things, where it's open source and people can use it in their own environments, but I want it to be a little bit more on the Azure AD or Okta kind of end of things with web-based and you know, much more extensible APIs and you know, things that are possible there. Since the last year of having uh, worked on the project since SUSE Labs, there's been a lot of changes. So last year at SUSE Labs, I was still working on the indexing code, and there was no active deployments of it anywhere in the world. It was just an idea that you know, eventually would get to something that could run. Since then, there's been more than 150 commits from uh, three major contributors. I've uh, done a lot of this, but some really uh, special shout outs I want to give. One of them is to a, a community contributor whose name on GitHub is Pando85. I don't know their actual name, but they've been doing a lot of work with our uh, testing and CI, which has been really great and really encouraging uh, for the project. And the other one is Alberto Planas from SUS who really helped out with a very major set of commits with improving code quality by using the uh, Cargo Clippy linting tool, which really helped set off that as a key requirement for the project to now have. So where I left off last year at SUSE Labs was with a chart that looked like this. So this is dated as 2019 with the relevant versions of the software across the top. And as we can see, there's a number of checks, crosses, and question marks for kind of it works, the hammers means it's under production or underway. And there's a number of rows of topics that these uh, projects support and um, may or may not have or are working towards. So things like self-service, can a user log into a website and self-manage their account, change their password, things like that. Radius, does it natively out of the box work with Radius infrastructure for Wi-Fi and VPN authentication? Distributed, is it able to scale in a way that lets it become like a global or very large scale identity management system. SSH management is, can it manage SSH public keys and infrastructure for your uh, Unix uh, servers? Claims is per session permissions. So for example, when your email client authenticates as you, your email client really doesn't need the permissions to change your password or update your home address. This kind of thing is session based claims. Device passwords is, can you have multiple different ways to authenticate as one user or account that then enables claims to occur? Extensibility is, can it be extended for the different needs and data representations of your business or environment? Representation is a very important one. Representation is, can the project represent people's identities in a way that is socially and culturally appropriate? And this means things like cultures that have multiple last names or no last names. Uh, characters that are not within the ASCII US alphabet. Um, so, you know, full UTF-8 support. So the way that we represent names and identities that actually, you know, really re respects the, the variety of people that exist in our world and, you know, can actually allow them to authenticate. Uh, does it have simple MFA? And this is TOTP, HOTP. You may have seen this as Google Authenticator. It's the six-digit code you've got to type in and WebAuthn, which is a hardware-based cryptographic auth, uh, better known as things like YubiKeys, Windows Hello, or Touch ID. So this is where we left things last year. And you can see that there's you know, a smattering of support here and there, a lot of things underway, especially in the Cunny column, uh, a few bits being planned here and there. So here's the slides updated today. And really one of the things that I, I hope that you notice from this is that there's not a lot of change. Um, one of the major ones is that OpenLDAP has picked up support for simple multi-factor authentication. But um, you know, even within 389, which is something that I work on, 
you know, certain things like self-service have, have gotten a bit stalled on some other upstream issues and really just, you know, funding requirements and, and what business directions are and what's important uh, and things like that. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of updates to Cunny and, you know, I, that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is what's been going on and, and what's happened in the last year. So one of the things that I'm really happy about that's happened in the last year, uh, presentation is not published because I am screen sharing from my machine and the reason is to do with the way that uh, my presentation software works and my speaker notes and the environment. So if you want the slides, I can send them to you later. Um, again, flick me an email, wbrown at suza.de, and I'm happy to send you a copy of the content or any other links if you are interested. So back to it. Uh, in the last year, one of the things that I'm really happy about is that we have documentation. And, you know, it seems like a very silly thing to say that, you know, we have docs and, and I'm quite proud of it, but the documentation is, is very complete. Uh, it's actually a requirement now in the project that any feature, especially a user-facing one where people interact with, has to have relevant documentation in the book. And so this makes it really easy, even for myself, you know, even though I wrote most of the project, I still need to look at these, this documentation in order to understand how to administer it, just because my brain just can't keep everything in it. So uh, I'm really happy with that. And I've had some help from a professional documentation writer to actually review this and to make it a lot better than it uh, previously was. So I'm really happy with that. Uh, another feature that we've added in the last year is the recycle bin. Uh, so it's one of those things that, you know, within like a, a general purpose operating system, when you're managing files in your graphical uh, file explorer, if you delete something accidentally, you can go to your recycle bin and recover it and restore it. And this exists as well in Microsoft Active Directory as of uh, Server 2008 and Server 2008 R2, I believe. And what can often happen there is, you know, if you're administering your directory and something goes wrong, maybe you accidentally delete a group or an account or some users, uh, you know, this can obviously have devastating effects depending on what it is that you have accidentally just touched. And especially given how central authentication is to a business and an organization, you know, uh, mistakes can and will happen. So the Active Directory Recycle Bin is uh, well regarded as one of the best features that was released for that product. Now, none of the other open source LDAP servers I've mentioned have the recycle bin, and, and it will be very hard to add it to uh, some of them. Uh, so I've added it to, to CunnyDM, and the idea is that, of course, when you have an account, if you delete it, you can get it back. But also, it does a lot of extra nice things as well. Like, if you delete the account, it can also restore all of its group memberships when you recover it from the recycle bin. So it really goes to a lot of effort to put things back as they were, which can help people to undo mistakes when they when can and will occur. Uh, since last year, we have now got fully working Radius support. And you know the, the project actually ships a Radius container as well with the correct integrations to work with our API. And I'm using it daily on my home network. Uh, the way that this works is uh, there's, a, there's an endpoint that can give out radius tokens, and the radius tokens are processed and allow the authentication. Uh, the way that this works uh, with your authentication is that rather than using your main account password, because your credential, your primary account credentials could have, say, TOTP, HOTP, multi factor auth, um, we don't want your main account credentials to be compromised if the radius server is compromised. And similarly, if radius is compromised, uh, we don't want that to compromise your main account. So the way that this works is that on the server side, we generate a device password essentially, and we give that to we make that available to you when you log in with your main credentials, and you can then copy that device password into your machines, and that then authenticates you to your network. So that helps isolate those credentials and what their function is uh, within the environment. So some other really cool stuff is that we actually support uh, VLAN assignment via uh, groups. So you know, depending on which member you are a group of you can be assigned onto different VLANs for your Wi-Fi infrastructure as well. So the Radius support has been uh, you know, a really useful uh, thing to have, especially for someone who's a bit weird like me and I have Radius at home. Something else that I'm really excited about is that, uh, again, since last year, we now have working PAM and NS switch modules, which means that you can connect your uh, SUSE machines to authenticate via CunnyDM. 
And uh, the PAM and NS switch modules uh, are really easy to set up and configure. And one of the other things that they do as well is they actually allow to, you to distribute your SSH public keys to your systems. So you can configure uh, SSHD with the example as, as per the bottom. And again, this is all documented in the documentation. Uh, and it will then allow you to enroll your public keys into CunyDM, and then they'll be available on all of your servers that are connected. And the way that this works is a bit similar to SSSD. The PAM and NS switch modules are very, very small uh, modules. And this is to reduce the attack surface area, as they are, of course, high value targets for you know, authentication. So these modules use a Unix domain socket to contact a local host resolver. And the local host resolver running on that machine uh, can be running as an isolated user. And we're actually taking advantage of some really cool systemd features like dynamic user IDs and a lot of the isolation features. Uh, and that local host resolver then proxies and does the work for you. This certainly makes a lot of things like AppArmor and SE Linux policies a lot simpler too. So one of the interesting things as well, by having a local host resolver rather than uh, every PAM module or NS switch lookup which runs in the context of the calling process, um, by having that local host resolver, we can establish trust in it. And that means that we can run caches on your systems. Very Again, very similar to SSSD. Uh, unlike SSSD, when you we ask you to clear the cache, we actually do it. Uh, it also seems to uh, perform much more effectively, and it does refreshes a little bit more reliably, and it doesn't uh, do a lot of unneeded spurious traffic as well, just given the way the protocol is designed. Um, we also can cache your SSH keys as well. So what this really means is that if you join your laptop to, to this, you can pick up your laptop, leave your environment, disconnect completely from the network, and you can still continue to authenticate, and everything is great. As well, the config is really simple. Uh, you can just define what login groups you want to be able to log into this system and provide a URI to a server, and the CA certificate will be validated as part of the trust route, and that's all you need. Uh, it, it is very easy to set up. So as a system administrator, it's very nice and quick to deploy this and very reliable to deploy it. One of the other things that's uh, really interesting about the way that the PAM and NS switch modules work in Cunny is that um, there's a set of problems around the way that UID numbers and GID numbers work on a Unix system that we've completely resolved effectively. So on a system, your user, when you log in, you get a primary uh, user ID number. And you also are given a primary GID number. And the thing is that if your user ID number, say in my case would be William, but I'm also a member of a shared group, let's say staff. And let's say there's somebody else like my manager, uh, Jim, he's got a user ID for his username, Jim, but he's also user primary group would be staff. Any files that I create or uh, manage would then be owned by my user primary ID and user primary group. So that would mean William and staff. Now that also then means that because uh, Jim would be a member of the staff group, he then has potentially the rights to administer the content uh, of those files and their permissions because of that shared user primary group. And this certainly can lead to some interesting consequences. The way that a lot of Linux distributions handle this is whenever they create a user, they also create a corresponding and equivalent user primary group. So uh, I certainly understand this is the case on Fedora. When you create a user, say William, you'll also get a William group. So you'll often see William colon William or something like that in my, my case. The way this is managed in uh, FreeIPA, which uh, attempts to resolve this problem, is that they do the same kind of thing, but on the server side as LDAP. And what they do is whenever you generate a user, the managed entries plugin will then template out an equivalent and related group. But of course, LDAP is not relational. This means that there's a number of problems in terms of that plugin actually updating and keeping consistent that other group. So if, for example, if you rename the account, the server then has to go and rename the group as well, and you have to keep all the ID numbers in sync and all of that stuff. So the way that Cunny resolves this is basically by looking at the problem and saying, well, OK, the unit of security that we actually care about is that it's the user private group that matters. And the only a subset of groups that exist may also be user accounts. 
So in Cunny, we've completely removed UID number as a field within the project. There is only GID number. And when you are a user, that GID number implies the existence also of your equivalent and matching UID number. So they will always match. This also means that we don't need to template out groups or anything like that. When you log in, we know that you must also imply the existence of your equivalent user private group. And this is correctly generated by the uh, resolver on your system. So there's an entire class of problems that have just been completely eliminated by just rethinking the problem and flipping it over. So this means that, you know, realistically, we are just administering groups because we can enforce that all the group IDs are unique and all the names are unique between groups and users and things like that. So there's never any conflicts here, which is really, really simplifies that attack surface. One of the requirements for PAM and NS switch in SUSE, though, is that we uh, conduct security audit. And uh, we have submitted this and we have passed that security audit. And I'd really like to thank Matthias Gerstner of the SUSE product security team who uh, did the audit and actually uh, went to the effort of reading my code. Uh, I really appreciate their time. And they uh, approved the, the code as it was, but they also gave a large number of really good um, suggestions of further hardening opportunities, especially around uh, you know checking user ID numbers when you're starting up the resolver to make sure it doesn't accidentally run as root, for example. Uh, so I really appreciate the security team looking at this because that is you know, another step forward to including this within OpenSUSE, for example. So another interesting feature that we've added is just because CunnyDM isn't wanting to be in, uh, constrained by the ideas of an LDAP server doesn't mean that we can't have one. And so we have an LDAP compatibility gateway for applications that may not support the uh, other type of standards that CunnyDM offers. And you know, there will be a large number of legacy applications where this is the case. Uh, I, the reason I added this was, in fact, just so that I could uh, use my home Nextcloud instance against uh, my CunnyDM infrastructure. So we now have an LDAP gateway. Uh, it's read only, and uh, it does generate certain data on the fly. So for example, all of the DNs in this example for DN uh, for William and member of, all of these are synthesized out of other data that exists within the database. Uh, there's also a number of mappings that exist for things like class and um, things like that. But we can generate entries that really look like what an LDAP server would put forward to a client. And it's enough that most clients really believe that they're talking with a real LDAP server and they, they know what kind of format they're looking for and can very easily authenticate to this. And some other really neat things that we've done in terms of making LDAP a bit easier to use is that historically LDAP to authenticate, you need to provide the full bind DN. So that might be UID equals William, OU people, DC blah, all of that very long string that can become very complicated and difficult for people to type out. Whereas in Cunny, we accept any unique identifier for the account as its DN. So it can be an unqualified, just the word William. It can be the William at domain name. It could be the UUID of the account. It can be the relative DN, or it can be the full DN of the account. So it gives a lot more options for administrators deploying applications when they're authenticating to ensure that they can um, you know, much more easily and simply configure their applications to, to be able to work with this. And of course, one of the things here is, uh, as mentioned, it has to be a unique identifier. So if there was ever a situation where two accounts happen to match the search qualifier, we would refuse to process the authentication. Something that uh, has really frustrated a lot of people in the past is things like observability. Uh, and as mentioned in my previous talk, good quality feedback. So one of the things that has been added to Cunny is really detailed logging. Uh, and part of that has been not just about what is occurring and the states that are being transitioned through in the server, but also the set of functions that are being called. And of course, performance logging so that we can understand where we're spending time. Because there's, you know, it's very common for people to come and say, oh, well, my application is performing slowly. And you say, well, great, now we don't have any evidence to that. Uh, so rather than having very difficult or esoteric options that we need to ask for, we have a performance logging uh, system. And you know, for example, 
we can see here that in this authentication message, we know that it took 0 0.006 of a second, and that was built up from this first search, which took 30% uh, of the time. And within that search, we can even see recursively what occurred within that. So we can see that there's a large number of calls to the IDL arc SQLite get IDL, which is calls into the indexing subsystem. So we know that a lot of indexes were accessed during this query. So we already have an idea about where a lot of the time was spent here. Uh, we know that a lot of indexes were occurred. Maybe it was a complex query. And we can understand and say, well, OK, maybe this is an area where we could improve the performance of this code. And then, of course, we can also see that you know, in a second search, we can see a much simpler query because it doesn't hit as many indexes. And uh, you know, it, it has, it's much quicker at returning the entry. So we know that it doesn't take as much time. So this gives us really good information about how the server is performing and also just really makes it easy to isolate and find issues as they're going on. And this really helps um, you know, people when they're using it because then they can go, wow, I can actually see what's going on. And you know, they can give us the information that I, well, for example, that I need to solve problems if they come up. And part of the reason uh, you know, with the related to performance, um, one of the things I've been interested in is, you know, having worked on LDAP servers for a long time, I'd, I'd like to think I know something about how to architect them and, and how they perform and, and what kind of workloads they're under. And a lot of the workloads that they're under tends to be read mostly uh, workloads. And so we really want to have a large number of parallel reads with occasional writes. So within CunnyDM, we've done a bit of, uh, a bit of performance testing, not a lot of uh, optimization of the code, but we have done performance testing. And we're already within 5% of the performance levels of 389 directory server. So there's been a bit of work to reduce some memory cloning and stuff like that, but hardcore optimizations really haven't been looked at yet. And part of the reason that we've really gotten within the, the kind of benchmark for an already well-established LDAP server is that uh, from early on, I knew how to really design an architect. And part of that is with a copy on write uh, set of data structures and strategies where writers and readers never block each other. So similar to BTRFS and ZFS, uh, I wrote a data structure library for Rust where you can have a transactional B plus tree in memory. And you know the blue copy here is the read transaction, and that is guaranteed to remain consistent until the end of that read operation. So we get ACID properties for our database. And the orange nodes is the writer that is occurring in parallel. And this works by copying the affected nodes, but only the affected nodes. And we can still continue to reference the uh, previous generation's nodes, and we can just do clean up afterwards. So while it doesn't look like it's saving a lot here, when your tree is very deep, so say seven levels deep with broad nodes, then you know if you've got, say, like 16,000 nodes, you may only need to update about seven in order to actually update any single key. So you're saving a huge amount of uh, memory copying and all that. But it also means that your CPU caches stay hot, content in memory stays hot, and uh, you're really able to then, you know, your read transactions are never blocking with your writes. So you get really good uh, read performance. But further to that, as a uh, database, one of the things that we need to be able to do is caching. And the way that caching is managed in other projects is a bit different. So with OpenLDAP and Samba 4, they're using LMDB. And by using LMDB, they made the caching problem not their problem. They mmap all of their database files into memory, and then they rely on the kernel's VFS cache uh, in order to actually keep those file uh, memory mapped pages in memory, and the op and the kernel is then responsible for what should be in RAM and what is not, and this uh, works reasonably well. But one of the limitations here is that the kernel's VFS is really designed to be a uh, generic operating system file cache. It's not designed to be a specialized database cache but also that the algorithm in use uh, for the kernel's uh, VFS, which I could be very wrong. There's probably a lot of kernel developers in here who are going to tell me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure it's LRU. Uh, and LRU is vulnerable to a number of cache invalidation attacks, uh, which certainly becomes a problem for an LDAP server where you can then direct 
certain search queries towards the server that will cause the cache to become invalidated and will bog down performance. And finally, of course, you know, the kernel has to deal with a lot more uh, uh, needs than just the application. And so when the, the kernel comes under memory pressure from applications, it may then start to you know, reduce the amount of content that's within the file cache in order to give more uh, memory to applications, for example. And so that can then uh, cause the open LDAP server's performance to degrade if there's other memory pressure on the system that exists. So the way that I've handled this within uh, Cunny is the application really needs to be aware of its caching because we can then make decisions that are more relevant to the application because you know the decisions made for the Linux kernel cache are very relevant to that subject matter, but they may not be relevant to what happens when you have a database. So to that end, uh, Cunny uses an adaptive replacement caching algorithm instead, which is not uh, vulnerable to the same kind of caching validation attacks as uh, LIU is, but also that uh, we need those transactional properties. And there was no prior art to this. So we've actually developed a transactional cache, which guarantees that readers will have a guaranteed point in time snapshot of that cache. And those readers can even include content on a cache miss. And the writers can continue and can write content into the cache. And we guarantee, I'm going to call it temporal consistency, that all items are correct at the point in time. So that, say, if a writer is writing to an item that a reader is also trying to include, we're going to keep the correct version, which would be the one the writer is attempting to modify in the future. So by having this transactional cache and using ARC, uh, we gain a lot of benefit. And already, as mentioned in the um, uh, talk, by benchmarking against 389 directory server, without a lot of work and with almost no tuning, we've almost come within the performance of 389. And 389, has uh, it uses a hash map with a LRU for its um, cache, and it's not it's not transactional in the same way. Uh, and that cache to really be effective needs to have at least you know you need to be allocating as much RAM as eighty percent of the size of your database content. So there's very little room where after that amount, it's the, the performance starts to really drop. Uh, it needs a large amount of memory in order to really stay effective in uh, providing your data. Whereas with similar benchmarks with Cunny, we found that with only 10% of the size of your database, so a much smaller amount of memory, just by using uh, ARC as the algorithm over LIU, we had much, much more effective um, cache hits. And we were also actually able to keep up with 389 despite, despite that change. So. You know, it was really quite something to see that having even such a small cache, the performance was still very, very good just because of that, uh, those properties. And so, you know, this has like been a whole bunch of rambling list of features and stuff that we've done for the last year. And there's a lot. Uh, a lot of it has been really foundational stuff. Uh, and I've added some extra rows here in, in the, the chart, the scorecard of what's been done. You know, that observability, those really good detailed logs, those algorithms and, and things that have been added to the server to really, you know, kind of future-proof for uh, performance, for, you know, scaling up to very large sizes. A query optimizer, no other LDAP server has a query optimizer. And, you know, things like RecycleBin and, and much more. And, oh, I forgot there was a transition there. Um, and you know, realistically, the point here, though, is despite all of those features and what's been going on, the point is that it works today. You know, I'm using this at home, and I have a very uh, interesting home network, as as I'm sure it would be called. Uh, on my home network, I have uh, thirty about thirty containers, ten virtual machines. Uh, I have a, a couple of SSIDs on site, and they're using uh, Radius as well. I have a friend who. Uh, has a site-to-site -site VPN with me, and they're using Radius against my Cunny instance uh, for their location. So you know, when I take my laptop there, it just joins my home network, we'll call it, uh, which is really cool. Uh, I have an externally facing VPN that I use to get to my home network, and I have a couple of VPSs on the internet, which uh, you know have 
publicly exposed SSH, and I'm monitoring that to for, for compromise. Though, of course, they only allow SSH keys, so one would hope that they're not being compromised. So I'm using this every day for a lot of different things. Like, you know, all of my SUSE servers are all using the PAM and NS switch modules here. Um, I have, like I said, web applications like Nextcloud, which are using that LLAP interface. And it's been extremely reliable. I think this is as a combination of elements that, you know, using Rust as the language means that, you know, we can have a lot of confidence in the changes that are being made. Um, you know, you, we have uh, a lot of tests. You know, testing has been very methodical. Every layer of the application can be tested uh, and modeled, which is uh, really important to gain confidence in what we're doing. And of course, everything has been designed with generally state machines uh, uh, to understand really all of what's going on within the server. So we can have very robust designs in the project. Uh, so yeah, I've had no production outages whatsoever. And you know, my manager will attest to how cursed I am. The bugs that I see in, you know, in my home environment is really unbelievable. So the fact that I haven't even managed to bring this down uh, either means that I'm being too nice to it or that I, I really have written something very reliable. So the question is now, you know, what's next? So I've talked about what the last year was, the things that have been achieved, and where it's running today, because you can now run this uh, on, on your network, and it now works. There's a real identity project. It's very exciting. So what's next? Uh, one of the major ones that I really want to do in the next year is WebAuthn. Uh, so WebAuthn is a hardware cryptographic authentication standard, uh, and it supports a large number of different authenticators. Um, and uh, I'm also the author, author of the WebAuthn library for Rust, which is, uh, and that's been really well developed. Uh, so at the moment, uh, I've just actually recently finished up uh, support for Windows Hello and Apple's Touch ID as WebAuthn authenticators. I have a Nitro key on the way because it seems like there's a bit of a hardware bug with that one. Uh, and there's actually an individual in Canada who is looking to use the WebAuthn library that I've written as part of their business applications, and they are working to get that FIDO certified. So WebAuthn is definitely on the cards, I hope, within the next year. One of the challenges there is, you know, the library's already written, but getting uh, the command line tools for CunEDM to actually call the CTAP uh, interface to be able to do WebAuthn from the command line is going to be one of those really important points. So you can use, you know, WebAuthn as your authentication from the CLI. Uh, and, you know, CunyDM as the server already has all the right protocols in place. The authentication is already challenge response. It was modeled and set up in a way to make sure that WebAuthn would be possible. So it's just going to be about gluing all of the pieces together now. And, and I keep telling myself it's going to be harder than it is, but I'm sure it's not. So I probably just need to sit down for a weekend and make it happen. Now, I already mentioned Samba. And, and I was mentioning Samba before as Samba for as a domain controller. But uh, I would like to get Cunny DM to work with Samba as the file server. And you know, part of this is personal interest. I have a Samba file server at home. But also, there's been some interest from other people around using uh, Samba with HPC and potentially other IDM projects, such as Cunny DM. So writing a Samba SAM module would be a really uh, useful and interesting integration. And again, opens up a lot of other interesting ideas. Um, one of the things there is certainly that uh, I think I would do it similar to Radius, where there might be device passwords or something similar like that. But certainly, I need to really like talk with some of the people in my team uh, about how to do this really effectively and and properly. Uh, so, so that would be a really exciting one is to have uh, Samba file server authentication working with Cunny as well. And a major and probably one of the other last major ones is OAuth. Uh, OAuth is really today the kind of de facto single sign-on authentication for the web. Uh, and you know this is contrast to SAML, which was the other major player. And, and I did um and ah about which one to implement, but I think OAuth is the way to go. Um, and that's, again, going to open up a lot of really good integration opportunities. For example, like I said, my home next cloud. It means that you know I'll be able to authenticate it with WebAuthn to CunyDM and then OAuth across to NextCloud and I'll have proper multi-factor authentication to my uh, environment there. But one of the other major ones that OAuth opens up is Kubernetes. The Kubernetes APIs do allow you to uh, auth to an external OAuth server, 
and they can consume claims that can be represented within that. Cunny is set up uh, and will in the future have claims with the idea that, you know, we were predicting that we were going to go with something like SAML or OAuth. So we knew that we would need to support something like claims for uh, inserting into these authentication tokens for uh, when people did things like working with Kubernetes. Um, yep, five minutes, thank you. Uh, and one of the last ones that has been uh, really exciting recently is that uh, I have submitted Kani into OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Uh, I believe it has uh, finally, as of today, uh, it got the green light from legal uh, in terms of licensing. There was just a couple of things to do with the way that the Rust packages were set up in the project that needed to be checked. Uh, so that got the green light. It's currently sitting in one of the staging projects, which I believe means it's going through a bit of uh, QA and evaluation. So hopefully within the next few weeks, that will be available in Tumbleweed. And as soon as it is, I think there's actually a version update that I need to do. Um, so uh, that should make it a lot easier in the future for when uh, people want to try this out. And of course, at that time, I'll have to update all the documentation about how to install it. And so that's really where we're at today. You know, from since, Oh, thank you. Uh, someone has just said it's in since yesterday, which is really exciting. Um, so uh, what's really cool is just that, you know, since last year, we've gone from an idea of here's a, an identity project that I would like to create to a point where, you know, I'm authenticating with this every day. Uh, there's been community contributions and, you know, a lot of progress in that year that, you know, honestly, I, when I was writing this talk, I was like, wow, there's going to be nothing to talk about. And looking back on it, there's been actually so much. So I'm really excited for what happens in the next year. But what I'd love to have from any of you who are uh, interested in here and watching this is, you know, feedback. As mentioned, you know, there is a lot of documentation there to help with getting it set up. And I think that it's, you know, there's probably still a couple of rough edges here and there. But, you know, getting it used in more environments, getting more feedback about what is going to be interesting applications to integrate with. These are all things that are going to help me uh, make the project better. So I'd really ask that, you know, if you have some time and you're interested, uh, please set it up and give it a go and get in contact. So again, thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been interesting and uh, I really appreciate it. So I have a bit of time now for questions. Uh, I think I'm about five minutes under, so or a couple minutes under. So, so are there any questions? I saw one piece of. Uh, I saw uh, someone comment. Well, I think when I was talking about web or then they said awesome, which is actually makes me very happy that I put in the time to write that library now. Maybe at a future SUSE Labs when we can all meet again in person, if someone buys me a drink, I'll explain all the ins and outs of WebAuthn that you didn't want to know. <laughs> all the fun stuff. So, so any questions or comments, feel free to use your microphone or chat. Doesn't seem to be the case. It seems. Oh, it's all good. Ah, do you want it? Hello, this is Giovanni. Question about your dependencies. You wrote this uh, pack, uh, software in Rust. Yep. I believe I, it's not an ecosystem I'm familiar with, but I think it's a rather young ecosystem. So how do you evaluate if uh, some other project is uh, uh, solid enough to use it as a dependency in your uh, software, if you have any dependency at all? Uh, there's there's quite a lot of dependencies, and that's um, uh, a really good question. Uh, Rust is not as young as it once was. It's certainly young compared to, say, maybe Python, but it's certainly a lot more mature today, I think, than uh, other areas. And it depends which part of the ecosystem we're looking at. Uh, so uh, especially when it came to things like uh, cryptographic operations, uh, for me, it was a bit of a obvious choice to use the Rust OpenSSL bindings just because they do link to LibreSSL. And you know, when we're dealing with cryptographic things, and especially with the eye to get this included in 
OpenSUSE, then having verified cryptographic libraries uh, was certainly something that was valuable. So, you know, that was a very obvious choice, for example. Uh, other not so, and, you know, of course, that's a very mature part of the code. Uh, there's other areas of Rust that are very mature at this point. So there are some data structure libraries and a lot of core things within the standard library that are, you know, really easy to take advantage of and use that are very reliable. So things like, you know, time representation for time zones in UTC and, um, you know, stuff like a hash brown, which is a, a hash map library that's based on Google's Swiss table. You know, these are all very mature and so, you know, not like high risk. There has only so far been one library that I was depending on, which was a web framework. And unfortunately, that project uh, did have a, uh, a problem with its uh, maintainership. And so I had to change to another one. But it wasn't as difficult to change that as it might seem because you know, the kind of uh, problems that exist in other languages uh, are a bit different in Rust, especially when you want to change from, say, one dependency to another. Just because of the really strong type system, actually making that change, you get a lot of help and feedback from the compiler about uh, what you're doing when you're making those very large refactors. So you can gain a lot of confidence in the changes you're making. Uh, so, you know, generally when selecting uh, projects uh, and dependencies, though, uh, general rules of thumbs is, uh, you know, what's uh, the community like? Are they, you know, doing things that, uh, like as a community, do they have things like code of conduct? Are they being respectful? Are you going to get the support you need when you have to ask a question? You know, these are really important things with a community because if you can't ask those questions, then, you know, when a problem does happen, you're you're going to be on your own and that's, that's really not good. Um, another really major one is, of course, like, you know, what does the library do? What's its surface area? Like a really small library, is a bit easier to kind of, you know, make a selection about, whereas, say, a web framework is a much larger surface area, so it's much harder to know whether it's the right choice or not. Uh, and so, you know, these kind of things come into mind. So, like I said, you know, choosing what was the right cryptographic library was pretty obvious and straightforward, I think, in my mind, just because of that, you know, established history around uh, the cryptographic ecosystem in the world. So, uh, and, you know, there's also just things like, you know, where the community is going and what other people report and what they're doing too. So uh, there are a large number of really good Rust libraries. And, and like I said, you know, just because of the nature of the language, there's a whole set of problems that just are removed uh, at all. And so, you know, Rust natively embeds a, a tool for checking for CVEs and dependencies. It embeds a tool for checking if you have outdated dependencies. And there's automated infrastructure to help you update those and actually do those refactors as well. So you can get a lot of really good um, uh, confidence in the libraries that you're choosing to use and and how they're managed. So yeah, it is quite different from other pro uh, from other languages and other projects. But yeah, there's a bit of a different process around it. But that was actually interesting because that was actually what what caught up uh, uh, the legal check was just that because of the way that Rust works uh, and, you know, is different in the way that uh, packaging works, uh, as a project, we have to vendor uh, the source of external libraries rather than, say, a C project where we would repackage and publish those libraries as separate projects. So, you know, with a C project, you might, if you have three other dependencies, you'd make three other RPMs that would then, um, you know, have their own licenses and, and checks and RPMs and spec files. Whereas with Rust, just because of the way that, you know, it has a uh, more broad ecosystem in terms of many smaller libraries, it makes it very infeasible, especially when you have like a couple of hundred dependencies to then go and write a couple of hundred spec files and keep those maintained. And of course, Rust is statically linked, not dynamically linked. So it means that, you know, even if you had those packages, they're really just devil only. And so, you know, it's only your end result application that really matters here. So, you know, vendoring becomes the more attractive choice, but it does make it a bit more complicated on the license front because now you have to say, okay, this package has, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G licenses within the software that we have within the source just because we are uh, putting these things together. But at the end of the day, the artifacts we're creating are still a statically linked binary that is a self-contained unit of execution 
which means again, less moving parts. So you can have a lot of trust and reliability in knowing that as it was tested on my systems is the way it's gonna end up on your systems because of the, that process and that chain. So yeah, it does change the, the equation a bit, but I think that it's worked out pretty well.